Thank you very much for coming tonight, y'all. We have people coming in, moving some chairs. Can we give a round of applause for the, you know, come on, man, for everybody in here tonight. Perfect day. We got rain coming this weekend, but a nice and perfect night for driving. And can we give a round of applause, please, for the Black Thompson Band, please? That boy can sing. He up here singing. Um, February, of course, as you all know, is Black History Month. Um, it's a month where we focus on, you know, just the struggle, the perseverance that our people that came before us had just to get us all in this place, this opportunity for us to sit here, fellowship, and just talk openly about the experiences that we've had. Um, every single year, the government comes up with a concept that they want to use in their own personal exploration of the month. And this year is African American and the arts. Because for some people, this is a new thing. Black folks do art, y'all. We create art. We've created most of the art that you see that is popular today. But I will tell you this. It started out as Negro History Week in 1926 by Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. They turned it into a month-long celebration in 1976. They gave us the shortest month, but I'm not going to talk a little bit more on that. But um, before we really get things started, <laughs> let me introduce our mayor, Tom Rich. And Tom, come up here. Thank you, Josh. Before you leave, um, turn around so everybody can see the number on your back. He's try he thinks he's trying out for American Idol tonight, so <laughs> humor him as you go. All right. In case you're wondering, I have all these lights on me and I can't see anybody. So I hope you're all out there. I hope you're having fun. If I screw up, it's Josh's fault. And you did get the number on his back. So they write my scripts because they're afraid I'll say something wrong if they don't. And I usually do. So here it is. Good evening, folks. I wouldn't have written that. And a big welcome to the City of Corona's Community Conversations, African American, African Americans and Arts. Tonight, we're here to honor the vibrant cultural heritage of our local black community and embrace an evening of celebration connection. I'm, I'm going to stop reading this. Uh, here's, here's the reality of it. We are here as a community. We're celebrating Black History Month. This is an awesome event. We've done it three or four years now, and we're all gonna have a good time. And to the, to the band, you've already started us off. I don't know where you are, but you've already started us off with a good time. In attendance tonight, we have uh, Vice Mayor Jim Steiner, if you can say hi. He's always the most popular because he was a firefighter. Also here is Wes Speak. Say hi. He always thinks he's the most popular. And then we have our uh, awesome planning commissioner, Karen Alexander, if she's here. Everybody loves Karen. And then we have Tom Munoz, our uh, Parks and Rec commissioner. And he's almost as popular as Karen. So uh, we've also got some members of our leadership team here as well. I think Justin Tucker's here if he's around here. I know uh, Police Chief Newman is here in the back. Um, you saw Josh. He thinks he's in charge. And then. Uh, Two other people that we should recognize that you're not going to know, but you should, and if you ever get the chance, please do. It was Amina. I, she is here somewhere. She put a lot of this hard work together, and so can we give her a round of applause? And then uh, another person that you don't know, but hopefully one day you will. She works on the third floor. She keeps our council going, and her name is Angela Nieto. Can we give her a round of applause? Okay, so the boring stuff's out of the way. 
Once again, I'd like to welcome everyone, and now it's time, and I'm thrilled they wrote that, to introduce our moderator and American Idol contestant, Joshua Smalley. <laughs> Hang on, Josh, I gotta read stuff about you. Don't, don't move, don't move. We're, Simon's down there. Um, Josh is our very own digital journalist. That's right, he works in our city's communication division. He's a creative who has worked on editing videos and commercials for companies such as Nike, Southern Comfort, Top Dog Entertainment, and Def Jam Records. Do you work, yeah, look at that. <laughs> Show of hands if, if you've seen any of Corona's videos on social media. I'm assuming you guys raised your hands. <laughs> It says here that Josh helped create those amazing videos and graphics. <laughs> Truthfully though, I think Josh is in his second or third year at the city. He does truly wonderful work. He's the nicest guy in the world. Me and us have ganged up on him that he needs to love Corona history. And with that, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Josh. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. so. Let's get this show on the road. Um, before we do, you'll see right here, stage right, we have two wonderful muralists from the Corona Art Society. They're working on a live piece right now. After this is done during the reception, ask them about their inspirations. Take a look at it. See exactly why they chose to do this, what they're doing. It's beautiful. It's, it's a talent and it's a gift. I can't do it. So, you know, can we give them a round of applause just for being here? <laughs> Art is a gift. It's, you know, voice through visuals, so it's, it's very weird. So let's get this going. Um, we'll start it off right now by bringing up our panel. Um, starting out, Cassidy Everidge, he's a thinker and an artist. He's currently studying at Otis College of Art and Design. He's worked intimately with a plethora of LA-based brands and projects that have received recognition from publications such as like Double XL and No Jumper and Travis Scott's recent Circus Maximus tour. He's currently expanding his body of independent work and he's seeing where that takes him, like a true artist. Cassidy, come on up, bro. Have a seat, good to have you here, man. Right? Next, we have Cloudy. She's an author and poet from Sacramento, California, representing Sac Town. She's currently a creative writing major at UC Riverside, and she continues to do community development work as a program advisor and programming specialist in Pan-African spaces on UCR's campus. She self-published her first book, Receipts of Ungiving Gifts, in November 2019. Come up, Cloudy. We're glad to have you. And then we have Justin Griffin. He's a captain, leader, mentor, and coach. He played basketball professionally for 11 years in various countries around the world before retiring in 2017. He's the owner of Pure Joy Basketball, and his goal is to use basketball to change lives. He also runs the after-school programming for all Title I schools in the Corona Norco Unified School District. Justin, come on up, bro. Man, good to see you, man. Yo, Glad you're here. Yo. Okay, y'all. Got you. Got your mics on? Mics yeah, yeah. Yeah. We yeah. good? Yeah, yeah. All right, let's get this show on the road, all right? We'll get it started with something simple. Remember, this is a conversation, right? So let's just talk freely. Let's be honest. Let's maybe get some engagement from the audience. So black history is tied to pop culture and the arts in America. What part of that history influences you in your daily life? And how does that influence kind of direct your art? Feel free, anyone. Go ahead, Cassidy. OK, OK. So I'm a pretty young guy. I'm 23. So that just goes to say that I really like rap music and how that touches the culture. And as much as I'm a fan of it, um, I feel like within my practice specifically, via painting, sculpture, writing, et cetera, um, I'm really interested in paying respects to said culture, but also critiquing it and thinking about it um, like very intuitively and uh, just academically as well. Well, like you have a piece out there right now. Yeah. Right? And you talk, I mean, when you talk to an artist, you go, who's your inspiration? 
you would hear someone say like, oh, you know, Charles Bibb, he's an acrylic painter, he's the guy. And you say hip hop, you immediately go straight to rap. And you're young, I'm old, but you're young, right? Hip hop's directing you. Cloudy, you're a poet, right? Mm -hmm. Would That's you right. say that you get a lot of your poetic influence from say like hip hop, from music? I would say I definitely get a lot of my um, inspiration from hip hop, but more, um, I think oldies. I think that I grew up really appreciating oldies music. I love Etta James. I adore her. Um, and trying to, trying to make people feel the way that music made me feel growing up is definitely one of the things that drove me to be a poet on top of understanding myself more through writing. And so I think that a lot of the black women that I listened to growing up was more of an inspiration, but hip hop is a huge part of how I grew up. I mean, I'm 21, so I'm even younger, right? And so that's a huge part of like what black culture is looked at and how black women and black people are perceived, especially in the age of the internet that I grew up in, so. I mean, that's a kind of a global thing, right? We were, the commodification of like black culture, we were talking earlier, um, we were in the back and we were talking about literally how black cultures, like a lot of things, and how a lot of people like, they want to be black, but we're not black. And it's like, sometimes they can vilify what it is, like we do and what we create until it becomes marketable and someone can make it, a dime off of it. Justin, you played basketball, you're a professional basketball player, you're a mentor, you talk to people. Um, let's talk about that, right? Because there are a lot of people out there who say, you're playing basketball for someone, you're making someone else money, and you're not making as much as they are. They kind of use you as like, uh, it's like, it's like a, a commodity, right? You're selling a product, it's whatever team you're playing for, it's merchandising. But at the same time, you have to use that to express yourself, right? You have to use your skill set, your art. How do you take that? Uh, so art for me, um, basketball was everything for me. Um, it was a way for me to uh, express myself and, and using the court and putting that time and effort in um, it allowed me to be me. And just knowing that myself was, um, uh, was enough, you know what I'm saying? So sometimes what I do nowadays is um, I just look at kids and I see them and I kind of uh, want to let them know that they're enough and I use that with the game of basketball. That's my art, that's my, um, that's my passion. So. Um, in terms of how uh, arts is a blackness and how it, um, a lot of people um, use what we do and um, try to make money off of it in terms of the arts and stuff like that, for me, it's, it's, it's just basketball. And it's a tool that I use to kind of help people, especially the youth nowadays. So most people will look at like sports and athletes and they don't think of art behind it. They don't look at leadership. They don't look at, at being a mentor and guiding people as art. And then you go and you listen to any speech given by Dr. King. You listen to any speech given by Malcolm X. You listen to Muhammad Ali, right, the greatest athlete of his generation. And he took words, not only sold himself, sold fights, sold bookings, but if you don't look at the way he spoke about himself as art, you don't know poetry, right? Um, how would you say, I mean, I played, I played sports growing up, so I understand a way, but let's talk more about that. How would you think motivation comes into play when it comes to leadership? How would you say that art, the ability to speak, to encourage, to motivate, like touch on that, touch on your experience with that? Extremely important. Um... It's all about confidence. It's all, it's, it's all about uh, believing in yourself and having someone support you. And um, having the support from a family member or friend really can take what you have and take it to a whole different level. Um, and confidence is key. Confidence comes with preparation comes with confidence, with, with practice, sorry. Um, and that's what, that's what made me who I am today is just hard work and practice every single day and just believing in myself. So um, it's a key piece, I believe, especially in motivating the youth and 
in the field that I'm in. Okay. Who would you say is your biggest inspiration? Uh, Kobe Bean Bryant, hands down. Um, just his uh, mentality. Um, I don't even know, like, the Mamba mentality was something that um, uh, I've seen since 1997, since he came in the league. Uh, yeah. Rest in peace. But just his dedication, his work ethic, um, the way he showed up every single day, the way he fought, um, the time and effort that he put into his craft was extremely motivating. And for me, um, I was a skinny kid from Corona, uh, Afro. Um, everybody would look at me like, oh, who's this kid? But I showed up every day. Um, I worked hard every day. My parents were there to support me, my siblings. Um, and just seeing him do what he did was, was something that I can't even speak on. Um, rest in peace. And the main thing about it was his after career. Um, right, he won an Academy that, Award. Yeah, I, I was put in that same spot in 2017. Um, my whole world was just basketball, and then I had to restart. Right, um, And shift. I didn't know... I didn't know what I was going to do, but I just leaned on the tools that I learned from basketball. Um, the, the hard work, the dedication, the um, communication, um, uh, dealing with pressure, dealing right. with uh, anxiety before big games. Um, like that just set me up for this next phase of life. Right. And now I see that in every kid that I, that I see every single day. I see myself in them. You know what I'm saying? So it's right, like, right. Um, I, I just want to let that kid know that I see you and, and you're enough and you just got to believe in yourself and just keep doing what you're doing because you just need somebody to um, support you and just say, hey, I see you, you can do it. Right. I believe in you. And it's amazing what that does for somebody. And that's important. And like we're, we're, like we're older. These are the younger folks right here. I remember being, they're like, we're like double up on them. So inspiring <laughs> too, seeing them. Like, it's sad. Cassidy goes, oh, yeah, I listen to the classics, like, Usher's 8701, and I'm like, <laughs> That's a classic, man. <laughs> That's, like, new to me. I don't know. It just kind of hurt. But, I mean, you, you guys hear him speak, right? Like, he's talking about motivating and, like, taking the tools that, like, the things that he's learned in his life. You guys are young, right? You guys are college students. You guys are really well-versed in your craft, but you're still developing it from the other perspective right he's gone through this journey in which he's had to figure out the next phase of his life and you guys are really just beginning your creative phase what are you thinking how do you get through that what are the the tools that you're trying to learn and adapt well i'll say for me first i want to backtrack just a tiny bit my mom's a huge super fan of sports so i grew up being treated like poetry was a sport for me <laughs> um I'm a very proud Niner fan, by the way. Um, and because of the faithful flag and how loyal th that is, my mom was always like, if you're gonna do art, you need to do it, you need to be proud of it, like I wanna see you at all the things. And so I was going to open mics and whatnot in high school as one of the youngest people like in the art community in Sacramento, like four days out of the week on top of my classes and clubs and other programs trying to get into college. And I remember right before the pandemic hit, I was talking about college with some of my colleagues and they were like, you shouldn't go. And I was like, what? <laughs> I love school. And they're like, nobody leaves when it's good. And I was like, but I can build a network in other places. Like to me, I don't want my art to only hit Sacramento. I don't want my art to only hit California. I don't even want my art to only hit the US. Um, I love traveling and I love being around the world and I had the honor of hosting a panel like this yesterday for authors and one of the things that um, one of the authors mentioned was that internationally poets in particular have this thing of like find your neighborhood poet, right. find your poet for when your plant dies, find your funeral poet, find your church poet. And to think about the fact that like, what type of poet do I wanna be? Do I wanna be known as? I think that that's something that I've been trying to figure out the whole time I've been writing. But in actuality, I know that one thing I wanna do is show resilience inside of my poetry. Um, I wanna spread love and I wanna be authentic. 
And I think that as long as I stick inside of those three, with those three values, I can, I can be somebody, I can be an artist that I'm proud of um, and that my mother and my family is proud of as well. You know, you know I'll, I'll touch on it because <clears throat> we talked about this a bit the other day. We were talking about this, about the type of artist you are. We, um, you mentioned being a bit frustrated with the categories, the categories that you're placed in as a, as a black woman, as an artist, right? Black art versus other art, right? Yeah. Cassidy, you touched, touched a bit on that too, right? Like, I'm an artist versus being a black artist. Come on, y'all, talk to me about this. Because I, I know that too, where it's like, oh, I want to edit, I can edit your video, I can do this piece, I can do your motion graphics. Well, can you do it? And it's like, I'm a working professional, you guys. Like, yeah, yeah. I can get it done. It's, it's, I'm not just going to go up there and be like, let's urban, urban fire, like, urban fire it, right? That's what they think immediately. It's like, oh, you're going to throw some, like, diamonds on it. And I'm like, no, but if you pay me to, I will, you know? <laughs> uh huh. Like, I'll do whatever yeah. you want, just cut the check. This is the job. So yeah. you understand, you guys understand. Do you experience that now? Yeah, I actually uh, have kind of a complicated feeling about that. I recognize the box and the limitations that can be said when someone ascribes you to something such as a black artist or, oh, you're this type of person, you do this type of thing. Um, so I recognize the violence in that, but I'm also from a, from the perspective of maybe not being able to change that violence so immediately. So I kind of take a stance of, oh, how can I complicate um, that stereotype that they're putting me in? And that's why I, I really think I like the, um, just the variety of this panel specifically, um, uh, Cloudy, you're a linguistic, you know, very much so, and that shows. Um, Uncle, that's my uncle actually. Shout out, <laughs> shout out this guy. <clears throat> um, I think it's dope having a, an athlete, someone who you wouldn't really consider to be well spoken or educated. That's not my belief, but it is a popular belief out there. Um, but you complicate that by being on this stage. Um, so for those reasons, I don't think we as a people should stray away from those stereotypes because those stereotypes actually are in place for a multitude of reasons, reasons that are largely out of our control, but say I like rap music, I recognize the box that that puts me in, but studying it academically complicates that and then it makes people think differently about that, you know? Right, I do, I do. Go ahead, Justin. That's deep, man. <laughs> <laughs> So proud of that kid. Um, <laughs> but uh, in my world, if you can ball, you can ball. You know what I'm saying? I if do. it, it don't care if you're white, black, Mexican, Chinese, it don't matter. Um, and for me, I'm kind of, uh, my mom is Mexican and my dad is black. So um, growing up in my household, people thought my mom was my babysitter and my older sister was <laughs> my mom. So it was, it was kind of, I kind of dealt with uh, that, that kind of view of things, but I saw, um, I didn't see, I, I never recognized color. You know, I just right. felt love, I felt um, energy, I felt emotion. Um, and I've, I've always been the black person in the room. I, uh, I went to Catholic school growing up all the way from kindergarten to eighth grade. I was, uh, me and my siblings were the only black people there usually. Uh, but if I focused on that, I couldn't be me. I, w I was just always me no matter what. So, um, well, yeah, you played so, ball overseas for a long time. And that was difficult, man. Like, the black experience yeah. that we have in America is not so, the experience and, and, of black and, folk in and, Europe. And my first year was in Germany, in Nuremberg, Germany. And just getting off the plane, I was just, I was in shock. Like, I couldn't. Imagine landing somewhere being 22 years old and not being able to speak to anybody. Like I'm, I'm like pointing at pictures on what I wanted. I would, I would go to grocery stores and guess from pictures on what I could eat. You know what I'm saying? But so, and then going to different parts of that country where we would play, like you hear the N word, like we'd get off the bus and like it was just in shock. Like, yeah, yeah. This is, I'm not home no more. Right. You know, but but I adjust. You you got to be willing to adjust at at all ages. So, um, 
and, and just really con control what you can't control. And I can't control the, the skin tone of my, right. of my skin. I can't control how people act towards me. Right. But I can't control my emotions and I can't control on how I react to it. So that's how I just move through life no matter what. You know, it really is about controlling like emotions, right? And just kind of like getting Absolutely. a grind on. It's, you know, it's kind of sad because that's like the experiences of like our mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers and great grands, like this idea of composure. Um, I was, we talked about this earlier. Um, Cassidy, you were telling me about how you really started to really get into your art to like really deal with feelings and the emotions that you were like going through. And you were open to say that. And I mean, I'm 41 years old now and I'm relatively, young. I'm relatively young <laughs> unless I'm talking to my daughter and then I'm an ancient. But um, I think for so long, the black community has prided itself on strength and composure. Like this idea that our forebears literally lived by the whip and they were composed. Or they were sprayed with hoses and they were composed. Or they sat at lunch counters and let people dump food on them and spit on them and beat them and they were composed because they were on a mission. And so you kind of go through this idea that like you have to always maintain composure. Don't let anyone see you cry. Don't let anyone like see you sad. Like you have to maintain yourself. It's kind of become a, a part of like blackness in America, right? But you were telling me about how you are trying to like literally express your heart through your art and be very open about it. Um, you want to touch on that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll provide a little bit of a backstory. So I grew up very stereotypical single parent household. You know, we did the best that we could to get by. And I'm very appreciative for that. But with that comes a lot of uh, just emotional turmoil that to, to point on to what you're saying, um, you kind of get groomed, if not by the household, by the society at large that you are to keep these things inside. And especially, I think, in corona, um, <clears throat> I, I feel like it's changing now, slowly but surely. But while I was here, and I'm, I'm still here, um, it's a predominantly white space. So when you come from a, a place where um, feelings aren't at the forefront of the conversation, and then you enter a white space, um, it can be hard. It can be really hard. So um, I got to a point where it became too much for me, it became way too much for me. And I literally had to decide with myself, do I just go down this alternative route that I won't say out loud, but you can infer what that would look like, what that might not look like specifically, or I can go 100% into my craft and just see what happens. And I went and I saw what happened. And I think that was like the most beautiful thing that I could do for myself. So now every day, I'm with my friends, I'm out on the basketball court, I'm out in these predominantly white spaces or in predominantly black spaces. And I'll find that I'm one of the only ones being like, yo, guys, what just happened right now makes me feel X type of way. And that can come with some backlash, but I think um, it's, us, it's up to us to be like a flagship for those conversations, to be the one to make those conversations um, normal. Right, normalize it. I mean, you're a poet, girl. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, yes. I, I will say that I started doing poetry under a pseudonym because I was scared of people finding out who I was and what I was writing. I was very young and I was like, I don't know if this is allowed. Um, and over time that pseudonym became what I call it to be, like I say is the best part of me. I think that Cloudy is the best part of me. I love her. Um, and I think that being a poet helps me politely, like, politely express myself in the best way possible. I think that it's the way that I lose my composure when I'm able to deconstruct language and put it on a page and perform it in front of people. I'm able to say things in ways that I don't hear them said before. Um, and 
I also try to translate that into my work. So I work um, at UC Riverside as the programming advisor for the Pan-African Theme Hall. And one thing that I notice is in these first years that are Pan-African coming to the hall, they're very closed off. They don't like to talk to people about what's going on, about struggling in classes, struggling in art, struggling in school, struggling being away from home. And they're afraid to lose their composure in front of other black people. Um, and my favorite thing to tell them is, I don't want anything from you except for you to succeed. When you feel like there's nowhere else to go, you come to me. I live with you guys so that you can come to me. Um, and I think that the reason I'm able to sit there and sift through their emotions and what they're going through is because I was able to do that in my own art a long time ago, and I'm still able to do that to this day. Right. You know, I, I have something for both of you <clears throat> because you both are college students. So I went to a private art school. I was like, I was the only black guy in the film department and it was very expensive. I was there on a scholarship. And um, I had classmates that would hire A-list actors and hire helicopters for like cam shots up top. And here I was like, I got a skateboard and a tripod and we can like, <laughs> use some duct tape and make it happen. But I think my, my art was like, it was damaged at the beginning because I wasn't, I felt as though I wasn't adequate enough. Um, and I, I think I was missing that camaraderie that diversity brings. I got it together. I said, okay, I know how to subvert this and take, use this to my advantage. I can shock people by doing things that they've never seen before. You go to Otis, which is like 60%, like, it's very, yeah. yeah. And you're at UCR, which has a nice, like, diverse group in a large minority community. How has being in those diverse communities, like, influenced and affected your art? Well, um, UC Riverside in particular, while it is not a, a predominantly white institution, it's also not a predominantly black institution. Very true, it's like 4%. Um, and I will say that even though whiteness isn't exactly a, like, a parent on campus in the traditional way, there are still ways to hold this, uh, uphold the standard of whiteness and white violence on campus. And I feel that very deeply, um, considering that I do work in outreach and community development with the Pan-African communities in particular. Um, and my department, even more in particular, is very, very small. So the creative writing department um, that I major in, it is, it's one of the smallest departments on campus. And we have the same teachers and we have the same professors, the same cohort of people workshopping their pieces. And most of them are not black. Um, and they tend to, the most of them are not people of color in general, and they tend to make that very known. I remember one time me and my friend were at a, in a nonfiction workshop, right. nonfiction. So these are things that happen to us. This is our life. And this white peer told her that her Spanish was not understandable because it wasn't proper Spanish. Um, I've been told that, um, that interactions in my pieces are too aggressive, um, oh, right. that some of my language is abrasive. And so it is interesting to have that camaraderie with other POC of like, oh, this is happening to us in different ways in this space. It happens. And it also is interesting to see how, despite there being a lack of whiteness on my campus, from the people that are there, it's very apparent. <coughs> um, like when, when they push back and to see that even like sometimes the professors do not stand up for first for the scholars, they right, just, they right, don't. Right. Um, especially I had an African American studies class that, oh, I'll have to tell you about that later. Um, <laughs> but I will say that it was, um, it was an interesting course to take um, and see how black scholars were treated in the class versus non-black scholars, even despite the fact that it was a space to learn about black history. Um, so yeah, but I will say that I am lucky to have been so, um, Inter interwoven with the black community at UCR. Most people do know me because of my jobs, their events, so I'm very public. I host right, events right, right. such as this one and stuff like this. Um, and so I, I do have the privilege of knowing a lot of the black scholars and creating really great relationships with them and um, having like that camaraderie across campus, like seeing somebody knowing them, saying hi, right, feeling right. a little bit of home, especially being so far from it's, home. It's important, it's just a nod. It's like, just that walk by and it's like an acknowledgement. Yeah. I know how it is. And it's, it's wonderful to have that. Um, but yeah, I've never been on a completely white campus, so I'm interested to hear 
what <laughs> that's like. It was the first time I saw someone like 19 years old, like driving a Porsche in my life, that's like insane. brand new Porsche. And like, we're going to go get lunch. You want to get lunch? And I was like, I brought it from home. Like, yeah, you know, I was like I got some jerk chicken. Yeah. <laughs> You're about to pay for something that don't taste as good. Um, <laughs> you're at Otis, man. Otis is different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you liking it? Uh, I'm, I don't hate it, but there's times where I don't like it as much. Um, I'm in a unique position um, because I got a scholarship um, to go there. It was a full ride, so I'm kind of like their token black guy there. Um, <laughs> it has its ups and downs because I get a little bit of the favoritism, but then there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot expected of you as well. Yeah. Um, so you kind of have to feel that. And if you don't hit that standard, like, boot. You know, you yeah. get booted out. I was, I was in school. I used to go, Mom, I can't believe it. Like, I'm the only black guy. And can you believe it? They, like, got Porsches. And this kid, he has his camera. And my mom was like, it's a scholarship to college. Shut up. Just go. No, and real. You know, it's like, so real. Four years and be done. And I was like, okay, mom, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> you know, we have the luxury of going, it's all right. You know, yeah, when yeah, so yeah. many people that came before us was like, like, come on. Like, my grandmother passed away two weeks ago. And um, she used to always say, like, Josh, let me tell you something. When I was a little girl, like, she came from Ethiopia when she was one years old. And she's like, when I was a little girl, I came to America and I would say, Dad, I can't drink out of this water fountain. And her dad would be like, Girl, they were trying to kill us in Ethiopia. <laughs> Go drink out the other water fountain. Yeah, There's yeah, a water yeah. fountain there. And like, it was like this weird thing where it was like, she was like frustrated with segregation. And then she was like, the Italians tried to kill us for years and years and years and occupied the country. We had to go like get water out of wells five like, miles away. Like, be grateful for the segregated water. And then here we are like, oh man, we got scholarships to college. It's just. No, no, that's Oh, crazy. goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like. In a way, it makes me happy that we can complain about being so fortunate, uh -huh. right? And we are fortunate. Justin, you got to go and play ball, man, and see the world. You are blessed, man. Blessed and highly favored. It's, yeah. It's, you know, like, you're a poet. You get to express yourself. You got a support system. When they were like, girl, you're going to go do poetry slams during high school? Like, I was in high school. My mom was like 7.30 bedtime. And I was like, mom, I am a senior in high school. I am not going to bed at 7.30. Oh, I didn't get to do anything but art. Don't. <laughs> it was just art. <laughs> you know, but, you, you know, like, like, we're fortunate. I think that's the great, like, blessing and curse of where we are now. Um, those that came before literally sacrificed their lives to ensure that we have the opportunities that we have now. And I think sometimes, because this is just the nature of people, we go and say, oh, well, you know, things aren't going so well for me. You know, it's like, like, the idea of being, like, grateful and being gracious for the opportunities and the lives that, like, that, were, that came before us. I've been really reflecting on this since I lost my grandmother because she was amazing and she wanted to be a writer. That was like, she, she did travel writing. She, my grandmother wrote travel writing for black people that were taking vacations across the country. She Real. wasn't writing in the green book, but she would write like in Jet Magazine. You can go here to this hotel and they're good to black people. And she wanted to really just like write about Bermuda and the beauties, but she would have to write this stuff. It was art. It really was like, let's take what you see and what you experience and turn it into something and also use it as a tool to warn people of danger. I mean, that's what painting is, right? That's what poetry is, right? Even like, like leading people on how to approach their selves in life, how to talk to other people, motivating people can be both a way to share an experience and make people overjoyed, but also use as a tool to warn and educate about the experiences that people may be coming. Um, I'll go to you, Cloudy, first, because as a poet, that's kind of what poetry is, um, sharing your experience to help people get through theirs. Um, is that something that like, you feel kind of directs your art a bit? I've, I watched a TED talk a while ago uh, of, another, of another poet, and basically she was talking about a workshop she did where um, the more specific the details are, the more relatable the story is. The more relatable the poem is, the more relatable the art is. And I found that very interesting because for, I feel like 
for a long time I thought like I'm the only person living a life like this. You know, right. I'm the only person experiencing the things I am and no one understands, which is why I started writing because I felt like nobody, especially my family, I'm very different from everyone else in my family. Um, so I felt like no one else really understood what was going on with me and how I felt and where I was. And when I started to actually perform poetry um, inside of art spaces and um, then teaching workshops to people and whatnot, I realize that that is true. Um, writing down your experiences and sharing them, there more people than you think have have experienced the same thing or something similar. And I I think there's something really beautiful about that, about having your own unique twist on it and being able to, like I said earlier, convey what you're feeling for somebody else. Right. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Good. So my uh, experience is my golden ticket, right? So um, what I do every day is I have to prove myself every single day. Depending on what type of player is in front of me, I may be working with pros. I may be working with college players, low, like total beginners. You know what I'm saying? Right. But um, like the details of everything that I've been through uh, have a connection with the there's, there's 7 billion people on this earth, 8 billion people, right? So you're not any different than anybody else. Everybody understands uh, emotions, feelings, and, and once you connect with someone, you can, they start listening. You know, if you don't connect with them, then it's one, one in one ear, right out the other. So, uh, experiences, everything that you go through in life is extremely important. Don't ever run from it, be you, um, and that, that's your golden ticket because you're gonna, you're gonna be able to touch so many different people just by being you. And, and, and uh, if you speak to older people, that's all they talk about is just, is just be you, find your passion, do what you love to do, figure out what you love to do and do it. And, and if you can do that, the uh, experiences that you gain from that is is priceless, and and you'll live every single day, and and be grateful and appreciative, waking up every day doing something that you love to do. The 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 worst thing is just having that regret on not being yourself and trying to follow somebody, and then you're just waking up miser it's, miserable. It's hard. Every day. It's hard sometimes, right? Where it's you feel really so in order to get a certain type of reaction or a certain type of respect, you have to be someone you're not. We can go into the whole rabbit hole, which is code switching, right? You ever hear it? Like, you gotta be good at that, though. You have to be good at it, but if you want, like we were talking earlier, like you wanna get a job, get on that phone interview and sound white. You gotta code switch. Change, change the voice and talk a little bit. You have to. Pronounce but, those words. But then also just be you, too. You gotta put your spice on it, but you gotta read the temperature of the room. You just can't just be, be you. you, you. Just you be gotta. yourself and be proud of that. I think most people will respect you for that nowadays. It, it, used to, it was different. Connect. I feel like people respect that on a personal level, yeah. but not as artists. Ah. I think that as an artist that you do have a persona, a reputation that is perceived and very much used. I'll say that I, I don't consider myself like a super big pro-black, like, Right. poet like like art wise like i write a lot more about love and intimate relationships but this month is the time that i get called the most throughout the year right because they want and you to i am black i am beautiful yeah and it's it's really yeah. interesting because i do have those poems and i love those poems and i love yeah. being black yeah I no really we do. love it but <laughs> but um i do think it's interesting how throughout the rest of the year like i get i get calls and i get emails and whatnot and right. i get i get the visitations and stuff from people but every year during this month in Juneteenth, phone ringing off the hook, right? Um, Juneteenth is a federal holiday now, so you're going to be getting way more calls. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I do think that it's, it's interesting because on a personal level, like people do like to connect and talk with me. Um, and it's super fun. But in an artistic space, there is a perceived image of me. And I think that it's interesting that they surpass so many of the other things I've written, including my book. Like, I don't think there's anything inside of my book that's, that specifically um, notes that I'm black. Right. But 
and that's my that's my only like I guess official piece of work out. And so it is it is very interesting to see how that functions and and why it functions that way. But nonetheless, I am very grateful to always be around black people. We, the first thing I said when I walked in the room was, ah, I love black people. I don't. So do I. We did a um, for this. We did some promo videos for this, and I I got to interview. Um, David, who works here at the city of Corona, and David had a very poignant thing to say about his blackness, that he loves being black, he loves everything about it, but he walks out the door and he knows that every day when he walks out, he's gonna be black David when he goes to work. And he loves being home because, you know, we don't have to talk about the blackness today, everybody, I'm just David when I'm at home. And he says it's something that he, he can't, you know, you can't turn it off, like even if, like, no, it doesn't matter, you know, like you just walk out and you just, you can feel the eyes, you can feel like when you step into a room where he's like, I'm, I'm black David right now. You know, I'm not David who happens to be black, I'm just, I'm black David. Um, that's been my but career. But we get used to that. I mean, I'm, I'm black 365 days a year. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> right, you know what I mean? I mean, it's I can't, it's you can't take it. I change the gear, can't change the skin. You, you can feel certain rooms different. Like, it's, it's, it's a little bit more sometimes. Right, right, but, right. I mean, you tend to just brush it off. I mean, you just keep moving. Because we, it's, it's what we do, man. Like, it's who we it. are. It's you like, have you know. to do it. And, and the ones that can't do that get stuck in their own ways, and they don't, there's no growth because they start making excuses. Yeah, we, some oh, people, is, such it, it such. weighs on them heavily. Absolutely, but right? you just got to let it go. They let it dictate themselves, you know. And then you get the folks that are, like, unabashedly, like, yo, I'm into my blackness. And then you get the folks that are like, don't act like that because. You know, like because like you don't want people to perceive you like as myself, perceive me as myself. No, yeah. Um, just to add on to that, I think it's important to kind of re-navigate uh, the ways in which we describe or associate with blackness, um, because uh, just me growing up, I used to like reading a lot. I used to like that stuff a lot, and then I got bullied out of it. But now that I'm back in it. I always like ask myself, why did I let other white people or other black people alike that were just maybe a little bit more closed-minded tell me that my speaking patterns weren't black? Why did I let someone else tell me that this wasn't black? And I happen all the time. In I the just think that's world. so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I'll carry a book on the bus. People will be clowning me. Man, look, what you, bro, why you got a book, bro? What you, nah, you ain't yeah, reading? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I am reading. I, I'm, I'm trying to stay. keep learning. My mom's always keep learning, son. That's right. Mijo, mijo. My mom's yeah. <laughs> mijo, mijo, keep, keep reading, mijo. To this day, I'm in university, and I, I have a huge bookshelf. I love reading. Um, and my, my friends will walk in and be like, oh my gosh, you have books everywhere. Like, well, how do you just read that? They're so boring. And I'm like, you, <laughs> if you picked up a book that you were interested in, I bet you it wouldn't be. Like, that. I feel like everybody at least once in their life has had that experience where they pick up something, they can't put it down. Right. And for me, that's always been books. Um, it was a huge thing that my parents, my grandparents at least wanted me to speak English really well because they are Mexican as well. Um, and they're not from the country. So, yeah, you're a poet. What's your book? What's your go-to? My go, like, okay, what's what the, genre? <laughs> not genre, just what's the book that's like, if you see it, like, you'll read it no matter what. What's your, what's the Perks your of Being a Wallflower. Perks of Being a Wallflower. <laughs> the that, the, that was a movie, right? It's yes, also they, yes, they made it. The they book made, is better than the movie. The book yeah, yeah. is better than the movie, but it's my favorite movie that's been, like, the, my favorite movie that's been a book. I usually look at movies, and I, I don't like them the same. I loved Harry Potter growing up. I don't, I, I don't like the movies as much as everybody else does, but The Perks of Being a Wallflower is a beautiful book, and it's, it's almost as beautiful as a movie. The only thing that just can't be the same is the last line. We are infinite. Like oh, that, yeah. that, that part of the of the book is so special on the page. It cannot function the same visually. You sound like a poet, like a writer. <laughs> That's what she does. Yeah, she sounds like a greater writer. <laughs> Did you the book? Yeah, I understand that. Okay, let's, we you talked about Kobe Bean Bryant. We get it. He's he's Kobe. Yeah. You're an artist, man. You paint. You do all this stuff. Who's your go-to artist? Ooh, maybe not aesthetically. Although I do really like this person, um, Carrie James Marshall, uh, just a North Star um, for black thinking, black artistry. Um, what I like specifically about him is his approach to his art making and his art viewing as an intellectual activity 
Um, so then that for me relieves a lot of stress and pressure of like, oh my gosh, like I need to come out with like my magnum opus every time just from my head. Um, and that kind of goes back to like the academic research part of it and um, just thinking about it like that. And then also um, to kind of go back to a little bit of what was said earlier about like really being yourself and like telling your story. Right. Um, I think in all of us, there are certain objects or shrines or sayings or songs that we have to share that actually act or can act if charged correctly as like a signifier for a larger story, like a larger macro story. Um, but anyways, that's just rambling thoughts in no, my but, head. But I, 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 I get it, like I can tell when that you are inspired by this and that's, I mean, we all have it. I was a, I was a film major and I remember my, my freshman year, like film 101 and everyone's like, what's your favorite movie of all time? And people are going, Umberto D and The Bicycle Thief and you know, they're naming all these like art house films to 400 blows and they're like, Josh, what's your favorite movie of all time? I'm the only black guy in the film department. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's a Five Heartbeats by Robert Townsend. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> And they're like, wait, what is that? Is that a movie? Um, and I'm like, it's the greatest movie ever made. It's like I have like five copies of it on DVD and Laserdisc. Like I do. <laughs> this on HBO Max. I've watched it 11 times in the last three months. I promise you. And they thought it was crazy. But, you know, they'll watch it and it won't connect with them. But it connected to me. Yeah, My yeah. dad was a singer, you know, and seeing that movie was like, you know, it's like this is the story that so many different artists went through that other people don't understand. I've been telling my coworkers in the community, hey, you guys gotta watch it. And some of them have, they've been like, what's the big deal? Like, it's, the music's all right. And I'm like, the music's all right, it's great. The performances <laughs> are amazing. You know, it's this idea that our art is ours and sometimes it only relates to us. I think, um, you know? Yeah, I, I have been seeing this debate on TikTok um, and, it's, it's really funny to see like people saying like, you don't like this art because you don't relate to it, even though most of the art that we, that we see today has originated from black people. Right. Um, it's, been, it's been taken and used against us to mock us. It's been taken and we've been locked out of it. Um, we've been denied access to the things that we've created and then told it's not for you. Um, and I think that it's really interesting how that functions and how people so quickly forget where things come from, especially in music. Um, I, my, my birth dad was a musician and all of my siblings sing or rap. I'm the only one who does not. And it was a huge part of me growing up. And the one thing that I loved that nobody else really loved was country music. Um, and they were like, no. And I was like, guys, there's so many great black country artists and country originated with black people. And it's a, it's a beautiful genre. If, if used correctly, right? And um, then being, my, my family being like, this doesn't tell our story. And I'm like, well, you're not looking for it. It's the commodification of black art, right? We were, we were talking earlier, I wasn't gonna use it, right? I was talking about like, I was using Ariana Grande as an example in her music video for Seven Rings, mm -hmm. right? Where, you know, here she's this like little teeny tiny Italian girl and she's doing like the whole, just got my hair, you just bought my new hair. And then she has this whole line where she's like, what is it? I got stacks that are like the size of my you know, have, derriere. Have and then you if you watch the video, it's like when they do that part, it's like, here's the black girl's butt. And it's like, that's not her butt. But just by using the lyrics and tone with the music, she tries to own that line. It's like a, it's like a blackwashing, like a blackification of that role. Right, and then the moment she's done with it, she can turn it off, bleach her hair, take off the tan, and be like, hey guys, I wanna do Wicked, you know? And get a two picture deal. And it's okay, okay. or Miley Cyrus, oh, right, on stage with, lady. Miley Cyrus on stage with Robin Thicke, you know, twerking, or trying to twerk, and going see, and then going, I don't know, I was just going through things. It's like, you were just going through things. You had eight black background dancers and decided that you didn't need to do that type of music anymore. You know, we'll fire the black producers and I'll go and I'll drop a, a folk album because, you know, this is who I really am. Our art gets commodified. The only place where I don't think our art gets commodified is in sports. Black culture and basketball, man. The Jordans. 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 
boots. Doc Martens. Boots. My daughter made me take off my Jordans. But Jordans, Jordans, right? Basketball shorts. Basketball culture as an art has influenced everything. Curtis Blow dropped a track in the early days of hip hop called Basketball. Yo on MTV Raps. Remember their stage? You guys don't know about Yo on MTV Raps. We do. But their stage was like a Brooklyn basketball court, chain link fence and basketball court. Basketball influenced so much art and influenced hip hop to this day, it's the man. Culture, man. It's a culture. The culture is it's big, it's uh, marketable, but it's us. Right. You know, I love being black. I love being Mexican. I love just people who embrace who they are. Right. You know, and, and it's a beautiful thing when you see cultures embrace who they are and don't be afraid and, and not afraid to um, express themselves, not afraid to bring their dish to a, uh, a Mexican dish to a black party right. or um, a Persian dish dish somewhere else you know what i'm saying it's right, just right. embracing yourself and that's where you feel you're most comfortable and and um the black culture spans worldwide we, well you know yeah it's, slavery it's made special. sure of that it's special yeah man we special. everywhere we're everywhere special we're everywhere in large amounts special. and it's different it's, it's yeah it's a beautiful thing if you ever travel out you notice that immediately it's it's amazing and it's and it's funny when you go to different countries like um they want to touch you. Like, oh, yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't know if you've ever been like, touched. Oh my God. Right. Like, I've had that where like, I was told, yeah, oh, your, your skin, skin is so. My yeah. hair is rough. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah it's, your skin I'm, is so soft. Yeah. I had that. Oh, I thought it was like rock. It's wild, man. Like, wild. I was always told, like, you felt like rock. And I was <laughs> like, put some lotion on. I was like, well, let me flex. You want to feel the rock? <laughs> yeah, I flex right now. But no, yeah, I had that. And the hair, oh, it's so soft. I thought it would be like coarse. It trips me out, man. It's like, but I mean, I mean, people don't know what they don't know, and it's okay. And if you can experience that moment with somebody, it's it's a moment. It's a shared moment, and and hopefully they can get a real piece of. Hey, I'm just like you. We the same. Flesh and blood, man. We the same. We're flesh and blood, and we so should love our people differences. People need more um, interactions like that because we are all the same. We We're are all the same. We are. We are all built in an image. You know. And I just think that, I don't know, I'm the same way. I think, you know, flesh and blood and flesh and blood. Appreciate who you are, appreciate where you come from. I am incredibly proud of the people that came before. I'm proud of my family. I'm proud of those that worked so hard in wherever they could just to provide. You know, people that were able to like just to persevere through the struggle. I don't know how like my grandparents and my great grandparents did it. Like when you talk I, about provide, like. You know? Like, like now I'm a father and um, just all parents out there, I, like you guys are the real MVPs. Like it's so, it's so hard to be a parent and to continue your life along with trying to guide another person's life. It's extremely hard and um, man, it's just, it's, it's just parents out there. I love all y'all, y'all. Hey, man, just, the baby's in the building right now. Got to come to the event. Got to bring the baby. Yeah. Baby behaving, too. <laughs> he probably went home. I was going, it's my, like, it's my daughter here, but I don't hear any child screaming, so I said, no, she must, <sighs> my wife must have did the smart thing and kept her away, because this whole thing would be her on the microphone. Okay, so um, I think we're, I think it's about time. What do you think? Yeah, um, let's go and let's, let's touch it up here. Let's take a look here. I just want to make sure we're on time. Um, for sure, for sure. How are we looking? Let me take a look. Let me, I, you five, know, I can't, five, I'm getting cued something, but these lights, I can't see anything. Let me take a look here. I see it's five. Yeah, okay, oh, so let's go. Oh, oh, you have something for us? Uh, she pointed to me, so I'm guessing I do. You do? <laughs> You have a poem for us? I do. All right, do. so Cloudy's gonna bless us with a poem as we, as we exit out of this. All right, I wanna thank you guys again for coming by. We really appreciate you being here. Um, can we give a round of applause before to these three?
please, right outside, you'll notice that Cassidy has a beautiful piece out there. Talk to him about it. Talk to our, our, our beautiful artists from Corona Art Society about their art that they've, they've completed. Talk to Justin about Pure Joy Basketball yeah. and how he leads and how, if you guys need anything like that, he, he's available. Um, and talk to Cloudy about her art that she's so graciously going to share with us. We're very excited. I'm so excited about this. Give us a piece, please. All right, I'll stand up. It's part of my thing. Um, this poem gonna hurt. Like redlining to the education system, like the comfort zone to an artist, the hood, like the hood to gangsters, this poem gonna hurt like loyalty loving liars. I've been scared of who's gonna hear me. Like if I shout revolution too loud, who gonna try to rip out my throat? See, I don't wanna be too brown in front of the wrong crowd, so I write heartbreaking hurt, but I got a message that's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt like stillborn babies and broken dreams. Like licking frozen spoons. Like my lineage never really loved just settled, settling is what they did best, and I'm tired of stepping on the neck of my dreams just to double what my parents did and dodge their disappointment. See, spitting this is gonna hurt. Like eczema in the winter and 400 years of slavery, this poem gonna dig deep like wells waiting water and how the world is on fire at its core. I've been burning to beat this bondage to barriers. I wanna speak sweet symphonies. One, I'm falling in love with the fleeting world. Two, this place, this time, ain't never gonna love me back the way I love it. Three, am I ever gonna change someone's life? Four, what does it mean when darkness and signs become your best friend? I wanna hold hymns close to my heart. But last time I held him close to my heart, ended up testifying these testimonies of tenacious tales, and I can't keep sitting at the table waiting for the damage door from the open, so this poem gonna hurt like breathing water and addiction. Like where I come from, if they not shooting up, they shooting you. And I'm sorry, my brothers keep taking what was home to you, but we lost pieces of home too. Like swimming was never a pigmented thing, just a boat in the ocean floor. So this poem gonna hurt like stampedes in the Lion King, like smoke smothered lungs and no oxygen mass. Like I'm scared that if I turn on my TV, I'm gonna see a headline about a brown boy that can't breathe because he was suffocating in a system where he was never free. Then this girl got the nerve to bring up the Emancipation Proclamation. Girl, don't tell me about your version of history. This poem going to hurt like a history lesson where don't nobody look or sound like you, where your story ain't told. Like boys who love boys and girls who love girls wasn't beautiful, like an organ decides who we were going to be. And that's why this poem going to hurt. Because this is where we tell our story. This is where we claim ourselves, know that man ain't discover anything. He just came up with the system. Y'all let them put crack in your backyard. This is the reason we had the Panthers garden the hood. Ain't no gardens around here unless they bring up product. Home cooked meals take the back burner for some fake product. This poem going to hurt like kids who had ghosts for parents and called a haunted house a home. Like kids who knew dead kids. Everybody got demons, but too cold to calm depression. Boy, what you looking at is cold out here. Keep making noise, you'll make it to Christmas this year. This poem going to hurt like blades to wrists. Like cold cunts ate a thing around here cover up kid nobody cares about your label even if you carve it all over your body everybody wants to make moves but nobody's moving we got kids in cages when they get out gonna be working for minimum wages and it's crazy the only way to make it out the ghetto is becoming a pastime look at what I can do for you spit pretty words throw a ball sing a song run the field let me put on a show for you am I worthy of your attention now no fantasies or falsettas no fictitious hope or surrealism this is a manifesto this poem gonna hurt like she gonna hurt and he gonna hurt, and they gonna hurt, and we gonna hurt. This poem is powerful. This poem is resistance. This poem is truth. So this poem gonna hurt like it's me. And it is. But we were beautiful all along. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Cloudy, thank you. Thank y'all for letting me share something with you. Nah, thank you for being here with us. You guys, it's been wonderful. We really appreciate you coming out. I mean, <coughs> you have time for questions? You want to ask a question? Please go ahead, ask a question, girl. I ain't going to stop you. I have a feeling you're going to do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, you got a mic. Hey, I'm Miss Cherry. Um, I just had a question maybe for the city. Um, so I wanted to talk about the colors that I've been seeing of, of the flag. Um, so we have uh, the red, the black, and the green, and I've noticed in marketing it's changed to red, yellow, and green. And I was just like, what happened? Okay. So, um, With the RBG? Yeah. So when, you know, we know Mar um, Marcus Garvey was Jamaican, so he intentionally had the red, the black, and the green. So in the red and the black, the red was for the blood, and that unites all people of African ancestry mm -hmm. um, and the shed for, the, for liberation, the shed of blood. Um, the black is for the people who existed as a nation, though not a nation state. 
um, and it is affirmed by the existence of the flag. And the green is for the abundant and vibrant natural wealth of Africa and the motherland. So I'm just noticing when I come up, I'm seeing red, yellow, blue, and I'm like, what is this? Where's the foundation? Where's the tradition? Where's the history of the people that laid down a lot of different things? And it gets kind of confusing mm -hmm. to the mind. It's bothered me the whole time. I haven't been able to focus properly because I'm like, don't cover my history. Don't commercialize my history when it comes to this because it's a lot of people that fought in the 20s for this message to be heard. And so for the cities or whoever made the changes and didn't talk to the, the community about it. Why? Why? That's the question, right? Yes. I got you. Thank and you. I, and I can answer that. Thank you. That's actually a good question. And I get it with Marcus Garvey, the RBG. As a designer, when we look to design things, we look for inspiration and color and, and flags. I understand the RBG. And for a lot of people, that relates to them. Myself personally, my family are from Aswan, Egypt, right? My father's from true Nubian. Yes, but see, but the colors are different. For example, my mother's side is Ethiopian, and our flag is blue, yellow, green. We throw red elements in there, but we look for the yellow star with the circular blue around it. Africa is so much more than RBG, and our ancestry is so much more than red, black, and green. Though it can be used for a lot of things, but Africa is more than just those three colors. It's so much more vibrant. If we want to talk about the history of Africa, we have to understand that it's so much more than what people decided it needed to be. I'm with you, sis, when you say, hey, you know what, maybe we should have did it. And maybe next year we will. Maybe we'll say, you know what, let's go back to the RBG. But we felt this year to do more color, more, more vibrancy. Because when you look at a black painting, it's more than just red, blue, and green. When you look at the creation of works, it's so much more than just those three colors. Pan-Africanism is great. Marcus Garvey was a great man with great ideas. But we can't just base everything we do off of these ideas. We have to look for new things. This is the new generation in which, you know what? Maybe we expand our palette. Yeah, but we also have to look towards the future. I mean, we live in the future, though, right? Don't we? I think, in a way, we have to look back at the past, but we also have to look at the now. You know? And we can agree to disagree, but I think it's, you know. If, if I could, if I yeah, could cut it just a tad bit. I do think that one of, the, one of the biggest controversies around Black History Month is, like, people not including Pan-Africans especially because America is a country of immigrants. We have a lot of people here that came from different places, um, including the Caribbean and Afro-Latino countries and whatnot. And so I, I do think that tradition is important to an extent, but I think one of the biggest issues we've had recently is that a lot of the policies and stuff that are happening in the world are outdated. They haven't been updated, they haven't been inclusive. Um, and I think that maybe changing a few things and trying to start within our community isn't such a bad thing. Okay. All right. Well, I, like, I think that was a great way to um, like kind of wrap this up because that does raise more questions. It's never just a conversation up here. The conversation continues once we leave the stage. It will be a conversation that has to be continued essentially for maybe the rest of time. Again, you guys, thank you guys for being here. We're heading out. Black Thompson Band, y'all. Give them a round of applause. We're about to get this started again. Please join in reception. And we can continue this conversation there. Thank you guys again. Good night. Come on, let's get everybody to sing this along. Sing along with this one. Come on. Lift every voice and sing. Tell it the never ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let all rejoicing high as the 
Come on, y'all. Let us march on. Oh, is one. If you know it, come on. Hey, sing a song. Yeah. Let us sing a song. Brothers facing the rising sun of a new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Come on, let's turn up one more time before we get up out of here. Come on, y'all. Girl, you're looking sweeter now. You got it every day, girl. I wish that I could love you now in a special way. Oh, you blow my mind. And I I'm so in love, yeah. You blow my mind, yeah. And I'm satisfied, yeah. Outstanding. Oh, girl, you knock me up. Exciting, yeah. You make me want to shout. 